Uh, welcome back, everybody, to episode five of Data Art Conversations with Sports Betting Industry Leaders. Today, we are joined by Joe Solosky, Managing Director at NASCAR. Uh, Joe's an old friend of ours and actually was on our, on our first episode um, many weeks ago. And I'm also joined by Matt Schatz and Kevin Twitchell, advisors at Data Art. It's nice everybody. to be on the other side of the coin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> welcome back, Joe. Um, Thanks for having me. Yeah, great to have you. Uh, so we got to know you really well uh, when you uh, were working for Sport Radar. Um, <clears throat> we spent uh, many conferences together, uh, many times on the phone. Uh, How has the transition been going from a data provider to uh, a company like NASCAR, who's a consumer of that data? It's actually been pretty seamless. Uh, it's, I liken it to how I was with Sport Radar internationally before I. Um, before I joined Sport Radar on the U.S. side. So I worked internationally for Sport Radar for two and a half years and got a lot of industry experience uh, in different continents of more mature markets so that when sports betting became legalized in the U.S., um, I had an opportunity to have kind of overseas experience knowing where the market was heading. Uh, so in, in talking to operators who also were coming from overseas, we were kind of on the same wavelength of where the industry was heading, but also understanding that there needed to be some level setting of it being a pretty new industry in the US or a brand new industry in the US. And also the perspective we were coming from in terms of the consumer being more daily fantasy focused um, where prop betting might be more uh, more prevalent than, than overseas or in-play betting would probably uh, happen a little bit quick more quickly than it did overseas. But in my transition to to, to NASCAR from Sport Radar after spending two and a half years working with operators on the data side, uh, I had a lot of great experience, not only from my international time, but my domestic time in terms of the contacts that I worked with um, on the operator side. NASCAR works with, uh, you know, we'll get into it a little bit later, but we have three authorized gaming operator partners and we talk to many different other operators who, um, who see NASCAR as an emerging sport in terms of sports betting. Uh, so from a contact perspective and, and a relationship perspective, it's been really helpful. And then from the data side of things, understanding what's important when you're selling data and, and official data to operators, going to a league and then working with that data and understanding how that's distributed to the supplier and then how that supplier distributes it to the operators, having some industry experience of, of knowing what markets work, how the data feed um, is, is collected and managed by the league and then sent to operate, sent to the supplier, which is then sent to operators. There's a lot of communication from myself to the supplier, to the operator in terms of um, what, whether it's metrics or data points are important or different from the NASCAR feed that allow us to create more engaging markets or different markets, especially with in-race being offered this year um, to, to really grow the sport from just a traditional pre-race market uh, prior to 2021 to be more focused on an in-race market uh, focused sport, or at least having that, uh, that feature as part of our offering um, in the US and overseas. Yeah, that's interesting that you just started getting into in-race betting um, because I mean, at least from my perspective, uh, NASCAR or auto racing in general is, is similar to to any sport that that has had in play betting, you know, forever. Um, you know, with all the different um, uh, kind of variables, right, within the race, you take into account weather, engine failure. Um, you know, you have somebody uh, middle of the pack, right, in the middle of the race. You might want to put you know a little something on that if, if you if you're a big fan or feel feel good about that that race or so. Um, yeah, that. I think that that's interesting that it took them, you know, to this point <clears throat> to actually offer uh, in, in play. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a huge technological, um, you know, innovation essentially to offer these in-race markets. If you look at the official data feed that NASCAR provides where they're timing and scoring, you know, it, it's not balls and strikes. It's you look, you watch the race this past weekend uh, for for the Coca-Cola 600. You're looking at hundreds, thousands of a second that's separating cars in a lap. So having an official feed is vitally important to the sport and to resulting settling bets uh, when, when it's coming down to that thin of a margin 
uh, for whether it's lap results or just overall race results, uh, that official feed is, is vitally important to the marketplace. So is that why it held up back because the technology wasn't there yet? No, um, I think it was a multitude of factors, you know, with, with all the different, we've had our timing and scoring feed up and running for quite some time. Um, and it, you know, it ran across our daily fantasy partners that used it, but it, but to a, to a micro level of kind of that in-race betting, there was a lot of innovation that needed to uh, be passed along from us and explanations from us in terms of the data feed uh, to the supplier. And then the supplier building those markets and not just building markets for the sake of building markets, but also building markets that actually were relevant to what a motorsport better, a NASCAR better would want to bet on. So there's a lot of research that goes into that as well of not just, you know, we're, we're concerned, you know, it's a, it's a huge concern of us at NASCAR of not oversaturating our fan base with betting. So, you know, to that point, even oversaturating our NASCAR betting fan base of offering kind of, you know, this slow rollout of pre-race markets to then in-race markets and we're offering, you know, 50 or 60, I think it would be kind of overload. So I think there's a strategic rollout in terms of these markets uh, and working with our supplier closely on how we do that and what, what those markets are. And, and talking about that saturation, Joe, tell us how does NASCAR as a league think about this overall betting opportunity, meaning is it like a big revenue opportunity where they want to be involved in the operations? Is it a revenue uh, opportunity, but they're happy kind of licensing the name and just collecting some money? Is it a brand building exercise more with the audience? Where does the league really see the opportunity? There's certainly a revenue component to it. It is not, it is not number one when we think about it internally at NASCAR. The big growth opportunity for sports betting at NASCAR is fan engagement. Um, and I've, I've said it a million times, I've been, been here for three months, um, but it, it is fan engagement, right? We see sports betting as a medium to uh, further engage our already existing loyal, strong fan base at NASCAR who may, who may never have bet on a race before. Um, to provide a compelling product to increase their engagement and their experience at a race by providing a fun, legalized sports betting market to, over, you know, to, um, to enhance their, their either viewership or their attendance at a race. Uh, but it's also probably the bigger part of the pie are the traditional stick and, uh, stick and ball fans of other sports who may not have <laughs> either watched or attended a NASCAR race before, but because they are betting on those sports, having NASCAR as an, as an offering and an attractive offering may get them to bet on the sport, which will then maybe get them to watch the sport, which will then get them to attend a sport and then become a, a fan. Um, and then that those network effects kind of branch out. And uh, we, we, you know, it, we see it in ticket sales and merchandise opportunities um, in viewership uh, across our broadcast partners. So it really is kind of a spider web effect. The revenue opportunity is there, but as we all know, it's a very slim margin business and the leagues get a, a part of that pie. Um, but the bigger part of the pie is the overall growth of the sport uh, and using sports betting as a, as a tool to um, increase our fans and our increase our viewership uh, for the sport of NASCAR. That, that, that's interesting. I think you, you probably learned a lot you know, from that from Europe, from your Europe experience and how it grew the sport there. So if you look at prop betting, for example, is that, a, would you use that as a strategy to get a younger base? Cause you know, to, to, to really entice a, maybe a younger audience that like you said, is a stick and glove, better casual football fan all of a sudden is a, into prop betting. Is that part of your strategy as well? Yeah, I mean, we're looking at, at all the different kind of micro markets, prop betting suppliers in the marketplace and seeing what they can do with the sport of NASCAR. And there are, there are a few out there who, who see NASCAR as kind of the next step of prop betting. And there's some really interesting markets out there that really go along with kind of the, um, you know, the driver focus, the individual focused aspect of the sport. So if you look at a really popular market for betting market for NASCAR, it's the head to head markets where you're, uh, where you're betting one driver against another. And there's, you know, it's a very long season, it's eight months, and a lot happens from race to race and from week to week. And there might be a, uh, there might be a, a driver conflict from the week before or some other event where it's really attractive to kind of bet against these, these two drivers head to head. 
Um, and that prop betting side of things is, is a way that we can really engage and create a compelling product uh, on the prop betting side where we utilize kind of the storyline of the NASCAR season and what's going on from driver personalities, um, you know, head to head to head conflicts or just other aspects of the season that go along and then utilizing that as, as a market that we can, that we can push uh, and that our, that our supplier can create as a sport. But when it comes to the props of, uh, you know, we're looking down the line of, you know, next, next fastest lap, who will win the next lap? Right. Um, right. Those are things that are really attractive to us and where we look, you know, 2022 and beyond of having those specific kind of prop markets um, that, that I would like to see. And I know you mentioned earlier that it's a big sort of innovation on the data side to be able to support all that. What are some of the other technology related challenges that NASCAR faces to, to realize its vision for sports betting? Yeah, I mean, we, it's, it's more of, it's more opportunities than I would say challenges. You know, I came in in a great spot uh, where in, you know, in March of this year to the league and we already had our ducks in a row in terms of partnerships and, you know, I'll do, I'll do credit to my predecessor, Scott Warfield uh, for putting that together. Um, and, you know, NASCAR has always been an innovative sport in terms of our timing and scoring feed and how we, how we cr create a compelling product, not only at the track, but also across our, across our broadcast partners with NBC and Fox uh, of on screen kind of those, um, instead of just kind of lap metrics, you know, single integer numbers to having those, like I said, tens, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of a second that uh, separate drivers from one another, the, you know, the individual speeds of, of how fast a car is going. Um, that's all, that's all super compelling as you're watching, you're watching a race. I think another technological advance that has come up in the last few weeks um, that will certainly create challenges, but I think also opportunities is the next gen car that was revealed last month. So the next gen car um, at, at NASCAR will be implemented next season. And there will be different opportunities there with whether it's cameras in the car and how that's integrated into broadcast versus how that's integrated into second screen. And there might be opportunities for individual drivers to have to utilize their sports betting partnerships on their racing teams to have a second screen on, on some other platform, whether it be YouTube or, you know, maybe even the live streaming uh, provider, if that's, if that's available. Um, that's something that we're looking at of how do we kind of take advantage of or uh, capitalize on these technological advance, advances that are always happening in the sport. And right now it's the next gen car of whether it's cameras in the car or more metrics that might be available. Um, across the across the drivers in race is something that that we see as an opportunity um, less so than than a challenge. That's great. Yeah, makes sense. Exciting to to think about that next gen car. I see you do it an awful lot with that. Yeah, I mean we it's it's a unique sport, right? In terms of our Super Bowl being the the first event of the season, and it was very similar this year with you know with Daytona kind of being the introduction of in-race markets and the, the response that we've seen to that in terms of year over year growth on betting handle and bet count um, increased dramatically across our, our providers that we, or our, the operators that we get uh, the, that type of information from. And next year, we'll see the same thing with the next gen car being introduced at Daytona in 2022. Um, there's going to be tons of opportunities from a sponsorship perspective, and then, you know, on my team, we're thinking about the betting opportunities in, in terms of, uh, you know, NASCAR as a, uh, as a league and a sanctioning body embracing sports betting, how the next gen car kind of fits into, fits into opportunities from our side. How's, how's sports betting <clears throat> working with your media partners? You know, as far as, you know, are you looking ahead to integrate it into the actual programming and having experts on and talking about the bets, you know, pre pre-race to extend the, you know, view, viewerships and like you said, second screen opportunities. Yeah. Our, our broadcast partners with Fox and NBC, you know, they have their own sort of betting uh, partnerships, uh, NBC with points bet and Fox with, with Fox bet. So there's a lot of integrations that they do on their own, whether it's free to play games or integrations with on-screen kind of uh, odds as they update with, with points bet and NBC when that, uh, when that kicks off in the second half of the season. Um, but, but we certainly see, um, you know, ways to kind of educate the fan, I would say, That's from a media perspective. Yeah. So, 
there are a lot of passionate NASCAR fans who are, um, you know, who, who are in media, right? Whether they're talking about the sport on, on the broadcast or they have social, you know, big social following. So we look at utilizing that of not only a way to kind of be a voice for the sport from a betting perspective, but also a big part of it for me is, is educating the fan on what NASCAR betting is, how it may be different from the traditional stick and ball sports. Um, and then also what are the unique opportunities of betting on NASCAR versus other sports as well um, in terms of the different markets that are offered and, and how it may look different from the stick and ball sports. But I see kind of the media and the broadcast perspective as being a great um, podium for education. Uh, you know, I like doing, I like having these opportunities to speak on behalf of NASCAR and, and our sports betting initiatives. Uh, but there are a lot of people out there who have Twitter followings and social media followings, you know, tens and thousands and millions more than I do. Right. So yeah. to have them out there and, and speaking on behalf of our sport, working in conjunction with us, getting the message out is a huge opportunity for us. And then, like I said, in the beginning, um, a, a big concern, I know it's a concern on the broadcast side, no matter what sport or what league you're talking about is the oversaturation. So right. there's a, uh, I think a good example this year has been what, NBA and ESPN have done with having kind of a second screen opt-in for sports betting with the betcast right. uh, for NBA games. So instead of just oversaturating your fans and saying that, oh, you know, here's the updated prop for Trey Young hitting a three is the next score, that can be on another feed. So you're not um, alienating a, a fan base who may not be interested in betting. At NASCAR, we look at it the same way where we don't want every lap to be focused around um, you know, a new offering or what the odds, you know, the odds update might be. There's an, there's an opportunity and I think there's a right place for that kind of on a second or third screen option um, in the sport. I think that's really smart and, and actually really important because by almost by definition or certainly by common sense, oversaturation in this case is going to mean something completely different to one section of the audience compared to another. I mean, in other words, some hardcore fans can't get enough of the betting. It might be the only reason they're tuning in and other people may be long time to the fans of the sport that have no interest in ever placing even a small fun wager and just want to enjoy the, the sports for sports sake. So I think trying to find a way to separate those wait, separate those things out, as opposed to trying to find a balance in between those two groups makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and it's not even from the it's not even from the broadcast angle as well. You can look at it from the at track experience, right? Where you don't want to just have um, and of course our our authorized gaming operators and our sponsors have signage at track. They have activation areas at track, but there are places that make more sense uh, for those opportunities than others, right? There are kind of sports bar or sport lounge type areas at our tracks that are more focused on kind of the sports betting side as opposed to at every concession stand having a having a kiosk um, or every uh, you know near every every restroom having some sort of sports betting opportunity there's the right time and right place uh, for those opportunities whether it's on broadcast at track outside of our tracks um, or you know in other retail environments as well where people may be eating drinking watching a race uh, there may be an opportunity as the le as the legislative landscape allows for mobile sports betting and betting in restaurants and bars there may be an opportunity for certain re retail screens to be focused on a betting angle versus a kind of traditional broadcast angle. And do you take a, a different approach um, in states um, that have already legalized sports betting in terms of the races being being held, held there versus uh, uh, states that are, are still kind of waiting for legislation to be approved? Absolutely. I, 2021 has been a big year for us in terms of uh, market access, and I think a big year for leagues and teams overall from a market access perspective. Um, NASCAR had the opportunity to work with uh, to work with WinBet in the state of Virginia, where um, their license allowed them to have a an at track betting experience at both Martinsville and Richmond Raceway, which are NAS NASCAR owned tracks. Um, so there was activation areas. There was uh, there were suites, um, there were different uh, signage opportunities for WinBet to capitalize on. And we'll see that as well in, in Arizona. Arizona is a very unique state in the way that uh, teams and leagues have been awarded licenses in the state to partner with a sports betting operator so that the Phoenix Suns Stadium will be a you know, potentially 24-7, 365 sports book for, for FanDuel. And uh, Phoenix Raceway, which is also owned by NASCAR, will 
also have that opportunity to be a 24 seven, three, six, five sports book, op, you know, operated by a partner of, of NASCAR. Um, so as we kind of hope and, and wait for other states to legislate, maybe in that manner, um, there'll be different opportunities for that across tracks in, in different states and in states where it's not legalized, you know, somewhere like Ohio, where a huge NASCAR fan base is, there's opportunities to educate the, the consumer on betting, which I think other leagues are doing, whether it's daily fantasy or free to play games, things like that, that kind of are um, a logical next step to sports betting. Yeah, makes sense. Okay. Well, I think you're in a good spot to really grow the audience. I mean, you, everything you've talked about today is is really smart that the leagues embrace it because we've seen, <clears throat> I think now all the major leagues are embracing sports betting. You know, I'm sure there was some old guard at NASCAR that, you know, even a year or two years ago, didn't even want to have this conversation. Mm -hmm. But I think when they see the impact you're going to have, I still think on the growth with the demo, um, you're going to grow the audience through sports betting without a doubt, you know, from that casual fan or that, like my son the other day, he was like, oh, damn, I didn't bet you know, on, a, on a car race. He never would have never would have never would have said that six months ago. And he was trying to figure out a driver's name. And he and he was like looking it up. It was, you know, and here's a you know, here's a kid that was betting on, you know, football all, all season. Yeah, well, well, I can't I can't talk to, you know, internally at NASCAR before March of when I joined, but just watching as as an outsider, um, I think they were kind of on the forefront of embracing sports betting. Uh, relative to some of the other leagues, I think, as as you said, Kevin, um, there there are some leagues that may may have been or may still be kind of a bit more reticent to speak about it. But I think uh, a huge step that we probably wouldn't have imagined this time last year was um, at the NFL draft when I think it was Mike Greenberg asked Roger Goodell about sports betting shortly after they signed their official league data uh, contract, and he talked about sports betting at the draft. I think it was the first question that was asked of him uh, before the first pick was announced. Uh, and he talked about that for a few minutes, which probably would have um, been been a question they he was not allowed to be asked prior yeah. to that. Um, so I think you know some of the leagues that may have been reticent to address it are are addressing it more. And I think NASCAR has been um, has been on the forefront. And you know it it kind of allows me to speak a little bit about how we've embraced this from the beginning. Um, you know, PASPA was repealed in 2018, uh, and and NASCAR was quick to realize the opportunity here in terms of growing our our fan base and our sport. And from the forefront, we kind of, as I said earlier, uh, my predecessor um, took those steps to line up all the partnerships that we have. We first and foremost signed an integrity partner because integrity is, is integral to NASCAR. Um, and it always has been in our blood in terms of, you know, having a rule book that our drivers follow, that our members follow, that our, you know, all of our employees follow. And there's a huge component to that around sports betting. So having an integrity partnership with Sport Radar was, was the first agreement that NASCAR did once sports betting became legalized. And then we kind of followed suit with all the other players in the ecosystem, whether that was a data relationship with Bet Genius, And then in 2020 uh, was the year that we really started lining up uh, sports betting operators as authorized gaming operators of the league, uh, starting with Penn and then uh, uh, BetMGM and then WinBet as well. And as we look forward down the line, we you know, we're very strategic in terms of who we want to partner with and who we're talking to about those authorized gaming operator partnerships, uh, you know, in for the rest of 2021 20, and beyond. And market access is a huge component of that. Makes sense. Um, okay. Uh, any more questions, guys? I think we could talk all day about, you know, <laughs> racing, you know. I want to see. I want to see this next gen. I think. I think the next gen cars too is also going to be really exciting for the younger demo as well. You Absolutely. Know, I mean, we've gotten such engagement. good. Yeah, I mean, we've gotten such good feedback around um, around that announcement. Not even from the sports betting side of things, right? Because that's that's to be seen of what what opportunities lie there. But just in terms of how the sport is innovating and the audience that it's attracting with with innovations like the next gen car. Um, but would love to would love to have you guys come up to a race. Watkins Glen is is coming up this summer in New York, um, which will be a lot of fun. We've got a lot of our a lot of our drivers embracing partnerships with sports betting. Um, uh, you know, Richard Childress Racing has a partnership with BetMGM, uh, 2311, and Bubba Wallace just announced their partnership with DraftKings. So on the driver side, they're embracing they're embracing it as part of the sport also. So that's an interesting point. So, so how 
does that work? So if a racing team uh, has a has a partnership, as you mentioned, with the DraftKings or a FanDuel or BetMGM, and then NASCAR has its own, uh, are there any conflicts there, or are, are these teams um, allowed to kind of you know run independently with with whatever partnerships they want to pursue? Yeah, it's it's almost the opposite. It really increases the the broader opportunity of of NASCAR and the racing teams to work together to um, push push across whether it's promotions or sweepstakes across a whole season of integrating kind of the um, the partnership that a driving or a racing team might have uh, of you know individual money can't buy experiences with that with that driver whether it's a dinner or a VIP meet and greet at a race. Or surrounding in a surrounding a race or culminating in our playoffs in November, um, NASCAR has a ton of assets that we work with uh, from the authorized gaming operator side, whether it's at track or digitally, that we can kind of combine with the racing teams, and it's allowed us to work more closely in conjunction with with the racing teams across those two different while they're two, while they're separate deals and they don't kind of bleed over to one another the way that the ownership structure works and the, the racing team and NASCAR is the sanctioning body that relationship works. There's been a lot of opportunities for me, especially being relatively new to the league, of being able to work with the, with the teams that are either thinking about or already have done sponsorship deals with sports betting operators of you know, realizing, hey, if they're also a, an authorized gaming operator of NASCAR, this really increases the value of the sponsorship in terms of what it can offer the, the consumer. Yeah, that makes sense. Oh, great. So I guess next time we'll get together, we'll be at a race. Do it. Be happy. We'd be happy to have you out there. Excellent. We'll be there. Yeah, it'll be fun. Well, super. Well, Joe, you know, thanks a lot for your time. And again, you know, best of luck in, in your new role. Um, sounds like you're, you're kicking butt already. So I'm sure you're going to continue to do that. Well, thanks so much for having me. I'm, uh, as you can see from my background, I'm in the midst of, uh, I moved from New York to, to Charlotte to, you know, be at, uh, at one of our bigger locations. And uh, I wish I would have been there this past weekend for the race, but I'll definitely make it to one soon and hope to see you guys there. Do they uh, provide a truck for you, you know, like a car truck and just take the car out and just throw all your stuff in there? And I'm, I'm hoping one of these days, maybe I'll, maybe I'll get the experience down the line where I can get one of my, uh, one of my, you know, cars that I, or the car that I own wrapped and have its own sort of racing Perfect. number or, uh, Perfect or our artwork around it. That would be that, that'd be the ultimate goal. That's a good, it's a good target to shoot for. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> well, all, all right. right. Well, okay. thank you very Drive much. safe out there. Thanks a lot, guys. It was great to see you. Thanks. Right. Good yeah. seeing you too, Joe.